Northern Lights by Philip Pullman Chapter 6 The Throwing Nets She walked quickly away from the river, because the embankment was wide and well lit. There was a tangle of narrow streets between there and the Royal Arctic Institute, which was the only place Lyra was sure of being able to find, and into that dark maze she hurried now. If only she knew London as well as she knew Oxford! then she would have known which streets to avoid, or where she could scrounge some food, or, best of all, which doors to knock on and find shelter. In that cold night the dark alleys all around were alive with movement and secret life, and she knew none of it. Pantaleamon became a wildcat and scanned the dark all around with his night-piercing eyes. Every so often he'd stop, bristling, and she would turn aside from the entrance she'd been about to go down. The night was full of noises, bursts of drunken laughter, two raucous voices raising song, the clatter and whine of some badly oiled machine in a basement. Lyra walked delicately through it all, her senses magnified and mingled with Pantaleamon's, keeping to the shadows and the narrow alleys. From time to time she had to cross a wider, well-lit street, where the tramcars hummed and sparked under their ambaric wires. There were rules for crossing London streets, but she took no notice, and when anyone shouted, she fled. It was a fine thing to be free again. She knew that Pantaleamon, padding on wildcat paws beside her, felt the same joy as she did to be in the open air, even if it was murky London air, laden with fumes and soot, and clangorous with noise. Sometime soon, they'd have to think over the meaning of what they'd heard in Mrs Coulter's flat, but not yet and sometime eventually they'd have to find a place to sleep. At the crossroads near the corner of a big department store, whose windows shone brilliantly over the wet pavement, there was a coffee stall, a little hut on wheels with a counter under the wooden flap that swung up like an awning. Yellow light glowed inside, and the fragrance of coffee drifted out. The white-coated owner was leaning on the counter, talking to two or three customers. It was tempting. Lyra had been walking for an hour now, and it was cold and damp. With Pantaleam on a sparrow, she went up to the counter and reached up to gain the owner's attention. "'Cup of coffee and a ham sandwich, please,' she said. "'You're out late, my dear,' said a gentleman in a top hat and white silk muffler. "'Yeah,' she said, turning away from him to scan the busy intersection. A theatre nearby was just emptying and crowds milled around the lighted foyer, calling for cabs, wrapping coat around their shoulders. In the other direction was the entrance of a Sithonic railway station, with more crowds pouring up and down the steps. "'Here you go, love,' said the coffee stall man. Two shillings.' "'Let me pay for this,' said the man in the top hat. Lyra thought, "'Why not? I can run faster than him, and I might need all my money later.' The top-hatted man dropped a coin on the counter and smiled down at her. His demon was a lemur. It clung to his lapel, staring round-eyed at Lyra. She bit into her sandwich and kept her eyes on the busy street. She had no idea where she was, because she had never seen a map of London, and she didn't know how big it was or how far she'd have to walk to find the country. "'What's your name?' said the man. "'Alice.' "'That's a pretty name.' Let me put a drop of this into your coffee, warm you up. I don't like that, said Lyra. I just like coffee. I bet you've never had brandy like this before. I have. I was sick all over the place. I had a whole bottle, or nearly. Just as you like, said the man, tilting the flask into his own cup. Where are you going, all alone like this? Going to meet my father. And who's he? He's a murderer. He's what? I told you. He's a murderer. It's his profession. He's doing a job tonight. I got his clean clothes here because he's usually all covered in blood when he's finished a job. Ah, uh, you're joking. I ain't. The lemur uttered a soft meowing sound and clambered slowly up behind the man's head to peer out at her. She drank her coffee stolidly and ate the last of her sandwich. Good night, she said. I can see my father coming now. He looks a bit angry. The top hat man glanced around, 
and Lyra set off towards the theatre crowd. Much as she would have liked to seen the th Sithonic Railway, Mrs Coulter had said it was not really intended for people of their class, she was wary of being trapped underground, better to be out in the open, where she could run if she had to. On and on she walked, and the streets became darker and emptier. It was drizzling, but even if there had been no clouds, the city sky was too tainted with light to show the stars. Pantaleamon thought they were going north, but who could tell? Endless streets of little identical brick houses, with gardens only big enough for a dustbin, great gaunt factories behind wire fences, with one ambaric light blowing bleakly high up on the wall, and a night watchman snoozing by his brazier, occasionally a dismal oratory, only distinguished from a warehouse by the crucifix outside. Once she tried the door of one of these places, only to hear a groan from the bench a foot away in the darkness. She realised the porch was full of sleeping figures, and fled. "'Where are we going to sleep, Pan?' she said, as they trudged down a street of closed and shuttered shops. "'A doorway somewhere. Don't want to be seen, though. They're all so open. There's a canal down there.' He was looking down a side road to the left. Sure enough, a patch of dark glimmer showed open water, and when they curiously went to look, they found a canal basin where a dozen or so barges were tied up to the wharf, some high in the water, some low and laden under the gallows like cranes. A dim light shone in one window of a wooden hut, and a thread of smoke rose from the metal chimney. Otherwise the only lights were high up on the wall of the warehouse or the gantry of a crane, leaving the ground in gloom. The wharves were piled with barrels of coal spirit, with sacks of great round logs, with rolls of kahushuk-covered cable. Lyra tiptoed up to the hut, and peeped in the window. An old man was laboriously reading a picture story paper, and smoking a pipe, with his spaniel demon curled up asleep on the table. As she looked, the man got up, and brought a blackened kettle from the iron stove, and poured some hot water into a cracked mug, before settling back with his paper. "'Should we ask him to let us in, Pan?' she whispered. But he was distracted. He was a bat, an owl, a wild cat again. She looked all around, catching his panic, and then saw them at the same time as he did. Two men, running at her, one from each side, the nearer holding a throwing net. Pantaleamon uttered a harsh scream and launched himself as a leopard at the ma closer man's demon, a savage-looking fox, bowling her backwards so that she tangled with the man's legs. The man cursed and dodged aside, and Lyra darted past him towards the open spaces of the wharf. What she mustn't do was get boxed in a corner. Pantaleamon, an eagle now, swooped at her and cried, Left! Left! She swerved that way and saw a gap between the coal spirit barrels and the end of a corrugated iron shed, and darted for it like a bullet. But those throwing nets! She heard a hiss in the air, and past her cheek something lashed and sharply stung, and loathsome tarred strings across her face, her arms, her hands tangled and held her, and she fell, snarling and tearing and struggling in vain. Pan! Pan! But the fox demon tore at the cat pantaleamon, and Lyra felt the pain in her own flesh, and sobbed a great cry as he fell. One man was, slif was swiftly lashing cords around her, around her limbs, her throat, body, head, bundling her over and over on the wet ground. She was helpless, exactly like a fly being trussed by a spider. Poor hurt Pan was dragging himself towards her, with the fox demon worrying his back, and he had no strength less to change even and the other man was lying in a puddle with an arrow through his neck. The whole world grew still, as the man tying the net saw it too. Pantaleamon sat up and blinked, and then there was a soft thud, and the net man fell choking and gasping right across Lyra, who cried out in horror that was blood gushing out of him. Running feet, and someone hauled the man away and bent over him. Then other hands lifted Lyra, a knife snicked and pulled, and the net strings fell away one by one, and she tore them off, spitting, and held herself down to cuddle Pantaleamon. Kneeling, she twisted to look at the newcomers. 
three dark men, one armed with a bow, the others with knives, and as she turned, the bowman caught his breath. That ain't Lyra. A familiar voice. But she couldn't place it till he stepped forward, and the nearest light fell on his face, and the hawk demon on his shoulder. Then she had it. Egyptian! A real Oxford Egyptian! Tony Costa, he said. Remember? You used to play with my little brother Billy off the boats in Jericho, afore the gobblers got him. Oh, God, Pan, we're safe, she sobbed. But then a thought rushed into her mind. It was the Costa's boat she had hijacked that day. Suppose he remembered. Better come along with us, he said. You alone? Yeah, I was running away. All right, don't talk now, just keep quiet. Jackson, move them bodies into the shadow. Come in, look around. Lyra stood up shakily, holding the wildcat pantaleum onto her breast. He was twisting to look at something, and she followed his gaze, understanding, and suddenly curious too. What had happened to the dead man's demons? They were fading, that was the answer. Fading and drifting away like atoms of smoke, for all that they had tried to cling to their men. Pantaleamon hid his eyes, and Lyra hurried blindly after Tony Costa. "'What are you doing here?' she said. "'Quiet, gal. There's enough trouble awake without stirring more. We'll talk on the boat.' He led her over a little wooden bridge, into the heart of the canal basin. The other two men were padding silently after them. Tony turned along the waterfront and out onto a wooden jetty, from which he stepped on board a narrow boat and swung open the door to the cabin. "'Get in,' he said. "'Quick now!' Lyra did so, passing her bag, which she had never let go, even in the net, to make sure the alethiometer was still there. In the long narrow cabin, by the light of a lantern on a hook, she saw a stout, powerful woman with grey hair sitting at a table with a paper. Lyra recognised her as Billy's mother. "'Who's this?' the woman said. "'That's never Lyra!' "'That's right, Ma, we've got to move. "'We killed two men out in the basin. "'We thought they were gobblers, but I reckon they were Turk traders. "'They'd caught Lyra. "'Never mind talk, we'll do that on the move.' "'Come here, child,' said Ma Costa. "'Lyra obeyed, half happy, half apprehensive. "'For Ma Costa had hands like bludgeons, "'and now she was sure. "'It was their boat she had captured with Roger and the other colleges.' But the boat mother set her hands on either side of Lyra's face, and her demon, a great grey wolf-like dog, bent gently to lick Pantaleamon's wildcat head. Then Marcosta folded her great arms around Lyra, and pressed her to her breast. I don't know what you're a doing here, but you look wore out. You can have Billy's crib soon as I've got a hot drink in you. Set you down there, child. It looked as if her piracy was forgiven, or at least forgotten. Lyra slid onto the cushioned bench beneath a well-scrubbed pine tabletop, as the low rumble of the gas engine shook the boat. "'Where are we going?' Lyra asked. Ma Costa was getting a saucepan of milk on the iron stove, and riddling the grate to stir the fire up. "'Away from here. No talking now. We'll talk in the morning.' And she said no more, handing Lyra a cup of milk when it was ready swinging herself up on deck when the boat began to move, exchanging occasional whispers with the men. Lyra sipped the milk and lifted a corner of the blind to watch the dark wharves move past. A minute or two later, she was in sound sleep. She woke. She awoke in a narrow bed, with that comforting engine rumble deep below. She sat up, banged her head, cursed, felt around, and got up more carefully. A thin grey light showed her three other bunks, each empty and neatly made, one below hers and the other two across the tiny cabin. She swung over the side to find herself in her underclothes, and saw the dress and the wolfskin coat folded at the end of her bunk, together with her shopping bag. The alethiometer was still there. She dressed quickly, and went through the door at the end to find herself in the cabin with the stove, where it was warm. There was no one there. Through the window she saw a grey swirl of fog on each side, with occasional dark shapes that might have been buildings or trees. Before she could go out on deck, 
The outer door opened and Mark Oster came down, swathed in an old tweed coat on which the damp had settled like a thousand tiny pearls. Sleep well, she said, reaching for a frying pan. Now sit down out the way and I'll make you some breakfast. Don't stand about, there ain't room. Where are we? said Lyra. On the Grand Junction Canal. You keep out of sight, child. I don't want to see you topside. There's trouble. She sliced a couple of rashers of bacon onto the frying pan and cracked an egg to go with them. What sort of trouble? Nothing we can't cope with if you stay out the way. And she wouldn't say any more until Lyra had eaten. The boat slowed at one point. Something banged against the side and she heard men's voices raised in anger. But then someone's joke made them laugh and the voices drew away, and the boat moved on. Presently, Tony Costa swung down into the cabin. Like his mother, he was pearled with damp, and he shook his woollen hat over the stove to make the drops spit and jump. "'What are we going to tell her, Ma?' "'Ask first, tell later.' He poured some coffee into a tin cup and sat down. He was a powerful, dark-faced man. Now she could see him in daylight— Lyra saw a sad grimness in his expression. Right, he said. Now you're going to tell us what you was doing in London, Lyra. We had you down as being took by the gobblers. I was living with this lady, right? Lyra clumsily collected her story and shook it into order as if she were settling a pack of cards, ready for dealing. She told them everything, except about the alethiometer. And then last night at this cocktail party... I found out what they were really doing. Mrs Coulter was one of the gobblers herself, and she was going to use me to help her catch more kids. And what they do is... Mark Oster left the cabin and went out to the cockpit. Tony waited till the door was shut and went on. We know what they do. Least, we know part of it. We know they don't come back. Them kids is taken far up north, far out the way, and they do experiments on them. At first we reckoned they'd tried out different diseases and medicines, but there'd be no reason to start all that all of a sudden two or three years back. Then we thought about the Tartars, and maybe there's some secret deal they're making up Siberia way, because the Tartars want to move north just as much as the rest, for the coal spirit and the fire mines, and there's been rumours of war for even longer than the gobblers have been going. And we reckoned the gobblers were buying off the Tartar chiefs by giving them kids, because the Tartars eat them, don't they? They bake children and eat them. They never, said Lyra. They do. There's plenty of other things to be told and all. You never heard of the nail kins? Lyra said. No. Not even with Mrs Coulter. What are they? That's a kind of ghost they have up there in those forests. Same size as a child, and they've got no heads. They feel their way about at night, and if you're asleep and out in the forest, they get a hold of you and they won't make anything let them go. Nail canons, that's a northern word. And the wind suckers, they're dangerous too. They drift about in the air. You come across clumps of them floated together sometimes, or caught snags in a bramble. As soon as they touch you, all the strength goes out of you. You can't see them except as a shimmer in the air. And the breathless ones, who are they? Warriors half killed. Being alive is one thing, and being dead's another. But being half killed is worse than either. They just can't die, and living is altogether beyond them. They wander about forever. They're called the breathless ones because of what's been done to them. And what's that? said Lyra, wide-eyed. The North Tartars snap open their ribs and pull out their lungs. There's an art to it. They do it without killing them, but their lungs can't work any more without their demons pumping them by hand. And so the result is that they're halfway between breath and no breath, life and death. Half killed, you see and their demons got to pump and pump all day and night, or else perish with them. You come across a whole platoon of breathless ones in the forest sometimes, I've heard. And then there's the Panzerborna. You heard of them? That means armoured bears. They're kind of like a polar bear, except... Yes, I have heard of them. One of the men last night, he said that my uncle, Lord Asriel, he's being imprisoned in a fortress guarded by the armoured bears. Is he now? And what was he doing up there? Exploring. But the way the man was talking, I don't think my uncle's on the same side as the gobblers. I think they're glad he was in prison. Well, he won't go out if the armoured bears are guarding him. They're like mercenaries, you know what I mean by that. 
They sell their strength to whoever pays. They've got hands like men, and they learn the trick of working iron way back. Metauric iron, mostly. And they make great sheets and plates of it. To cover themselves with. They've been raiding the Skraelings for centuries. They're vicious killers, absolutely pitiless. But they keep their word. If you make a bargain with a Panzerborn, you can rely on it. Lyra considered these horrors with awe. Ma don't like to hear about the North, Tony said, after a few moments. Because of what might have happened to Billy. We know they took him up North, see. How do you know that? We caught one of the gobblers and made him talk. That's how we know a little about what they're doing. Them two last night weren't gobblers, they were too clumsy. If they'd been gobblers, we'd have took them alive. See, the Egyptian people, we've been hit worse than most by these gobblers. And we're a-coming together to decide what to do about it. That's what we was doing in the basin last night. Taking on stores, because we're going to a big muster up in the ferns, what we call a roping. And what I reckon is we're a-going to send out a rescue party, when we hear when we heard what all the other Egyptians know. When we put our knowledge together, that's what I'd do if I was John Farr. Who's John Farr? The King of the Egyptians. And you're really going to rescue the kids? What about Roger? Who's Roger? The Jordan College kitchen boy. He was took same as Billy the day before I come away with Mrs Coulter. I bet if I was took, he'd come and rescue me. If you're going to rescue Billy, I want to come too and rescue Roger. And Uncle Asriel, she thought. But she didn't mention that.